my turn. Yep. I'm ready. Welcome to the podcast. The podcast. <laughs> Why did you read that? Question mark. With me, Peter. And me, Megan. That was good. That was like professional. It's like we're learning. We got right into it. That was so good. I'm proud of us. So every month-ish, depending on... It's been a bit longer. Our apologies. Yeah, we've had a a schedule thing. Summer reading. Several things. Takes it out of us, guys. Sign up for summer reading. Yeah, Uh, it's happening now. The three of you who haven't yet, (laughs) because it seems like everybody did. But we get together about once a month. And we talk books, and we have uh, together sort of an unusual taste, mm-hmm. and that's where the name comes from, is like, so why did you read that? <laughs> yep. Um, no judgment implied. Usually. Minor judgment occasionally. Occasionally you read something, you know, I'll bring in a Jurassic War, and it's like, yeah. eh, there, there that's was fair. Judgment there, you're right. That's fair to judge. Yeah. Um, so the way this usually goes is I bring in four books. I briefly describe each one, and then Megan will pick two of those to hear about more in depth. Mm-hmm. And Megan does the same thing, brings in four books, yep. uh, describes them briefly, and I pick two of those to hear about. Mm-hmm. So you hear about four books in detail mm-hmm. and eight books total. At least a little. Yeah. And a lot of uh, weird tangents. Yep. That's the basic structure. So that that encompasses about eight minutes of a 60-minute podcast. (laughs) (laughs) And then the other key facet is we usually start with a joke. Yes. I should bring up my joke. I was going to tell you, uh, yesterday, I came up with a library joke and promptly forgot it. And then was like, should I... Should I bother telling her that I had a joke that's gone? Is that, that's not really a compelling story. You need to just text those to me in the moment. I do. I need to just immediately. Yeah. That's a good idea. Then I'll have a record of them. Yeah. And someone else, and uh, my partner who does not like my jokes, mildly enjoyed it. So I was like, this is about as good as it gets for me. Yeah. I appreciate her taste because she does enjoy many of mine. (laughs) Yes, she does. (laughs) Let's see how this week goes. Are you ready? I'm ready. What do you call a line of men waiting to get haircuts? I don't know. A barbecue. (laughs) I I don't know why I like that the most. It's just because uh, I like barbecue. (laughs) But I did like that. Yeah, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Barbecue. All right. I'm a suck for wordplay. I mean, it's pretty good. Thank you. I've uh, I've been cutting my own hair since like 2020. Yeah, I think we've mixed all gotten into some results. <laughs> Heavily <laughs> mixed results. <laughs> okay, I brought a slightly different format. Okay. For my books this time. Okay. I brought four books that I'm basically in the midst of. Okay. In hopes that you would be able to. Chop one out of my list. Hmm. And, Are you, you know, looking for something to abandon? I am. Okay. I'm looking to, you know, I get into this thing. I think a lot of people have this problem where you're like, you start reading a book and you're like, eh, and then you start reading another one and it's like, eh, yeah. and that's how you end up having like four books running simultaneously. Yeah. And then you can't really get into any of them because you're like dividing your attention. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about all of these. All right. And then... With the hopes that you'll be able to help me take one that you're like, you know, it sounds like you're not so hot on that one. All right. I'll see what I can do. Okay. So this is an older book called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by Jerry Mander. And this was a book that was written, I think, probably in the late 70s. Um, And it's about how this guy basically is saying that television was altering the way people think and, like, changing... Our humanity. Okay. It's interesting right now to read because a lot of the arguments he's making about television, I would say, are... You could replace the word television with, like, social media or Uh. something, and it would be almost identical. Okay. The next one is called A Place of My Own by Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan is a nonfiction writer, mostly... In Defense of Food. I was going to say Omnivore's Dilemma. Omnivore's Dilemma. Okay. Yeah, he's done a bunch of foodie type books. He did one about like taking hallucinogens recently. Mm-hmm. 
This one was about his quest to sort of build his own writing cabin in the back of his house. Okay. And he's like completely uh, a place of my own. Oh, okay. And he's completely inexperienced as far as building, architecture, all that stuff. Okay. He kind of wanted to do a hands-on project. Sounds like you. I know. <laughs> That's what appealed to me about it. <laughs> Uh, the next one is, so there are three in the series of Dreadstar by okay. Jim Starlin. Um, so there are three Omnibi editions. Omnibi. <laughs> I read the first, but not the second and third. Okay. Um, this is a very cosmic adventure type comic. Okay. Maybe a Star War, but with uh, weirder. Okay. Yeah, that'll do for now. Okay. Uh, the first volume has amazing art, by the way. Okay. If I forget to mention anything else or I don't talk about it, um, the art's amazing. So it's a, it's a graphic novel? Yes. Oh, okay. It's an older series. I think it's probably from the early 80s. Okay. And they finally, like, reprinted it and everything. Part of my Part of my problem getting through it has been the first volume, you can sort of see the workings of these different comics publishers. Because they had to stop the series, then restart it with a different publisher. And that happens probably three or four times. Okay. So you kind of have to do a lot of recap and stuff, yeah. which I was like, I get it. Because there was probably 18 months between <laughs> what right. happened here and what's happening. But for me reading it all, yeah, whatever. The last one is called Command and Control by Eric Schlosser. Command and Control? Command and Control. Okay. And it is about the Cold War missile program in the United States. Okay. Eric Schlosser is the guy who wrote Fast Food Nation. That's probably his okay. most famous. Greeley was mentioned in that book. Greeley was. Correctly. He called it a rural ghetto. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. <laughs> Poor Greeley. That's, I always bring that up when people talk about Greeley like or something. I'm like, that's, that's the way Eric Schlosser described it. I'm like, thanks a lot. I think that we are a fine community. I think so, too. Uh, but anyway, this one's a pretty in-depth exploration of how the missile program worked. Okay. It's interesting to me, as far as I had no idea the sort of depth and breadth of the missile program, and it profiles a lot of the people who worked in the missile silos. Okay. And I guess a lot of these were like in the Midwest and in the South. Um, just in these super rural places where they would buy land from, like, farms mm -hmm. and put a giant nuclear missile out there. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting. Yep. Okay. So those, well, are, those are my four. That is quite the variety. It, yeah. This is uh, probably my most, my most diverse reading month I've presented so far. Yeah. Kind of um, all over the place. <laughs> I'm a bit of at a loss. Uh, let's start with a place of my own because I find it amusing how much that sounds like a you thing. Yeah. I, I'm a, a tinkerer, yeah. you know, and I will do completely impractical projects for the sake of doing them, you know, like building a bookshelf, which I enjoyed, but it is like the most impractical thing in the world. Yeah. Cause like by the time you buy the lumber and put in the time to stain it and do all this stuff, I was like... Uh, I, I can see why Ikea is a thing. <laughs> like, they're smart. <laughs> so in this book, uh, Michael Pollan owns a house in... It's like Maine or Vermont, somewhere in the Northeast. And it's got some land on the back of it. And he decides he wants to build sort of a, like, small cabin for writing. Mm -hmm. And so... He also feels like he's a writer, so his work is in the world of, you know, the floofy arts world, and he wants to do something more concrete and hands-on. Get out of the brain and use his hands. Exactly. And so uh, he kind of embarks upon this project, which is he works with an architect first, but he's, like, pretty specific about, I want this to be something I can build. I want to build it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to, like, hire people to come and build it because I could just do that, you know, whatever. Is he going to include, like, electric and yes. plumbing? Wow. I don't know if it's got plumbing in it. So far, it doesn't seem to. But okay. as these projects do, in my experience, you know, <laughs> things 
escalate and get more complicated as you go. Yeah. So I would say what I'm enjoying about it is I'm, I am learning things about, you know, buildings and like architecture and stuff like that. And, you know, some of the process of making a building work uh -huh. and what does and doesn't work architecturally and stuff like that. I would say what I'm not as happy about is, like, it's pretty uh, in-depth. And I'm like, you know, to be honest, I don't really care that much about, like, architecture from ancient times. Right. And, like, <laughs> sometimes I'm like, you know, in really ancient times, were they, like, so concerned with architecture or were they, like well, this is the stuff we've got <laughs> and we need to make it into some kind of a shape that we can be inside of. <laughs> you know, a little more necessity. That will not collapse upon us. Yeah. It needs to save us from dying and also not kill us. Right. And that's pretty much what I'm looking for in a house. So it goes in a little, it gets a little like architectural theory-y at times and like... Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes I'm entertained because he, he works with a builder to help him just because some of the stuff's so heavy and Right, I was going to say, there's no way anybody could, I mean, I wouldn't imagine you could do 100% of it without anyone, like, lifting the other half of a beam. Exactly. So, those parts I get a little, you know, bored by. Yeah. I guess the other thing is, you know, the way my brain is, is good at some things and not at others. I don't have a good ability to, like, picture an environment in my mind. Mm -hmm. So as he's describing the building, it's just not... Right. I can't see it in it's my just mind. words. Yeah, it's like a pile of words. Yeah. So when he's describing the the layout of the building, for example, I can't... My mind just doesn't work that way. Yeah. So I am enjoying, like the writing because he's self-deprecating about his building abilities and i am sort of enjoying too how there's like this battle going on between the architect who designs the building the builder who acts to build it and then also there's like a code enforcement guy mm -hmm. who's like real nitpicky about you know every little thing yeah and so there's these sort of tensions between these <laughs> different groups and Michael Pollan's just kind of in the middle of it being like, can't we all just agree? Like, <laughs> I just want a room. Yeah. He's like, you know, this doesn't seem like it should be so complicated, but here we are. Yeah. So I think people who are like tinkerers would really enjoy this book. I think people who like sometimes like uh, doing a project in a book is like a nice way to structure a book. Right. Because you have a beginning, middle and end. Right. and you can kind of see the process through. And I think people would learn a lot from this book. I'm learning a lot from it. Mm -hmm. And it's presented in an entertaining way. I just, maybe I'm learning a little too much mm -hmm. of things that I'm not as interested in. Right. Or so, planning on using. I assume you're not going to be building a shed or anything. Well, currently I would be, comp well, to be honest with you, I am considering trying to build... <laughs> a bar on wheels in my garage of course you are so that i could wheel it up against the wall you know 360 days out of the year and then wheel it out and probably find like a spider nest and then right. clean that out and dust have, all the have a bar at my house <laughs> but uh that's that's a hypothetical okay anyway your point is correct like this isn't knowledge that I need. <laughs> Let's put it that way. This is far from a necessity for me right now. It's not like a textbook. <laughs> so I do. I would recommend this book to other people in a, a weird way. Yeah. But it is one of the four that is probably overloading my reading capacity right, right. now. Or my attention span. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So there you go. Okay. You want right. to hear about my four? Yeah, I do. All right. So first I've got The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. And that is a romance novel written by a woman who is a scientist. And she has written two books so far, although the second hasn't been published yet. 
Um, I was lucky enough to read it because I got to review it for Library Journal. Well, well, well. So that's exciting. Well, well, well. Um, and it, I liked it enough that I went back to read her first book, which is this one, The Love Hypothesis. Our battery is flashing. Uh-oh. Maybe we should stop and change the batteries. Okay. Pause. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't remember where we were. You had just told me about the love hypothesis. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a romance novel written by a scientist, and all of her books focus on women in STEM careers. Okay. So, um, and it's, you know, love stories between awkward scientist types and um, other scientists, like gruff, kind of seemingly potentially mean <laughs> But then it turns out they're big softies, other science types. I don't know why it's never occurred to me to think of like a, I'm picturing like a gruff lumberjack scientist and mm -hmm. it's, that character type has never occurred to me before, but well, I'm it's intrigued. Like, so the, the male character in this particular book, he's the kind of, of person who his students flee his office hours in tears. <laughs> okay. Kind of gruff. Gotcha. Like, yeah. A Norm Piercy, if you will. Oh, name and names. <laughs> Calling back to early 2000s University uh, of Northern yeah. Colorado. He liked me well enough, so. I liked Norm quite a bit, yeah. but he was not known for being a, he was not. a gentle touch. <laughs> no, and I think people got mad at me because I, I kind of knew him out of class because I worked in the English department, and so I would talk back to him a little bit, and he accepted it, and I think it made them mad. I think he liked that a little. I, I think so, too. I think that was kind of his, Yeah. I don't know, his way. If he could intimidate you, I think that he would just intimidate you more. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> My second book is This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone. It's co-written. And this is kind of a literary, poetic, experimental novel a little bit about time slash dimension travelers and they work for opposing agencies one is the garden one is called the agency and they're both trying to kind of engineer a future that they envision that is kind of diametrically opposed to the future of the other hmm. and so these two agents start writing letters to each other and fall in love over letters oh okay yeah I didn't know that this was headed the love direction. Yeah, it's and it's not it's not a romance novel. It's very literary, but it is about like two people who are fundamentally different in every way, kind of connecting. Cool. Yeah. All I could think at first when you said the title, "This is how you lose the time war," is "This is how you lose it." <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, I've, you've now affected every person who has heard yeah. this. And you're welcome. And that's going to happen, and I hope you're satisfied. It's too late to turn it off and avoid hearing that. <laughs> yep. My apologies to everyone who uh, had to yeah, listen to that, including fine. myself. They're fine. They're <laughs> fine. You're welcome. Uh, my third book is one that I'm actually not quite finished with. I think I'm a bit over half. And it's called The Beast in Aisle 34 <laughs> by Darren Doyle. And it is about a guy who works for, like, a Home Depot-ish kind of a place. And um, he has a marriage that's not entirely happy, but they are expecting their first child. And he has been a werewolf for about three or four months. I was like, at the start where's the book. beast coming in? <laughs> yep, he is a werewolf. Okay. And he works in the, I think, the lighting fixtures aisle, 34. Okay, so wait, he... He's in like a somewhat troubled marriage, mm -hmm. but he has not been a werewolf the entire time Correct. he's been married. He, was, he got into some sort of an accident and was attacked, mm. and then the next month turned into a werewolf. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that sounds like a, a, what am I thinking of? A Goosebumps title. There was like yeah, the, yeah, I can see that. There was some like the abominable snowman of Pasadena or something like right. that. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of that. Okay. And then my final book is a graphic novel. It's called Crushing by Sophie Burroughs. And it is pretty much wordless. Um, there's not much in the way of dialogue or words at all. Um, and it's kind of a, a sweet story about modern existence and loneliness and 
how the world almost feeds you images of what you don't have, or it can feel like that. And then um, connecting with other people and, and huh. that kind of a thing. Um, so it's sweet and cute and very fast. Okay. These are some good choices. Thank you. I'm interested. I, I want to hear about the Beast in Isle 34. I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well have just been like, well, first I'll tell you about the Beast in Isle 34, <laughs> and then we can go through my other books. <laughs> And I have to admit that I'm struggling with this one a little oh, bit. Oh, no. I know. So it, it's kind of marketed as like a dark comedy horror. Okay. And I'm not seeing the comedy as oh. much. Um, occasionally I'm seeing it. But mostly he just seems sad. Because oh. it's supposed to be like a commentary on masculinity. Like today's version of masculinity. And so like you have this guy who his wife comes from a family of very manly men and he is not. And so he feels like he feels the difference and all of these family get togethers. This is part of why their marriage is maybe not all that it could be. Okay. And, um, he works in this like home Depot kind of a place, which is like a very masculine place. Traditionally, it's like, right. like the men go to build the things, you know? Sure. But he doesn't entirely feel at home there. And then he becomes like this werewolf and it gives him this feeling of power and everything. But also he isn't entirely in control of the power. Mm. And he figures that out when he, so he's, he's constantly looking for excuses to be out of the house on the night of the full moon because he, he doesn't want to tell his wife I am a werewolf for probably multiple reasons. (laughs) Makes sense. So um, one of the ways that he ends up coming up with an excuse to be out is he joins a LARPing group, (laughs) which for anyone who's not familiar, that's live action role play. So it's basically people doing Dungeons and Dragons, but instead of doing it on paper, they dress up and have dialogue and hit each other with like rubber swords and stuff. Gotcha. And uh, so he joins this group and I think he ends up having more fun than he expected doing it. But he also, so like he, he volunteers to, keep like watch on the settlement overnight because they're camping in the woods oh sure and then he sneaks off and he changes and does his werewolf thing and then the next day um one of the members has disappeared and it's oh no pretty it's it feels pretty obvious that he has probably killed and eaten this guy (laughs) Heavily, heavily suggested that yeah. that's probably what happened. Yeah. Oh, no. And so he starts, <laughs> it, it becomes like the conflict of he he was finally feeling some sort of power in his life. And now it turns out that maybe it's just another way to, to like be out of control. Gotcha. Of things. So I'm about halfway through it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to finish it or not. I'm going to try to finish it. But I have to admit, it keeps getting backburnered by the other things I'm reading. Fair enough. So. Do you feel like sometimes, sometimes when I read a book, I feel like people say it's funny or a comedy because they don't really know how to categorize it. Maybe. Like it doesn't neatly fit into a, like it's not really a horror. It's not necessarily a romance. You yeah. know, it's like, I'm not sure what this is. Yeah. It's too genre to be literary, but too literary for genre. Yeah. Yeah. It, that might be it. Yeah. Um, it might also just be that people, whoever is describing this book is able to find humor in what I just find sad. Yeah. That's possible. But mostly I just feel bad for this guy. I'm like, he, he has a, what feels like a pretty miserable life. And I find it difficult to laugh at that. Yeah. But then I also don't like a lot of those comedies like meet the parents where people are, are doing things that is humiliating, you know? Okay. Um, so it's, uh, could very well be a me thing. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know how I would handle if I became a werewolf. I I would have to tell my partner because I'd just be like, too this hard is to keep too much secret. work to like yeah. keep a secret. I am a werewolf. Yeah. And uh, and first she'll be like, let's get you to the doctor yeah. <laughs> because I think you hit your head. Yeah. But I, I'm sure you'd be able to prove it. <laughs> I think so. I'll be like, let's strap this GoPro to me and I'll go out in the woods. Yeah. And on the full moon and return with the footage and right. then we can yeah, discuss it. Yeah, you don't it. want to do it in front of her because who knows what you'll do. Maybe it would have to be the conversation would be like, I'm going to present to you an odd hypothetical 
And what I need from you is to treat it as very real. I see now I kind of want you to try this. <laughs> but then if I do it, I'll be the, the boy who cried werewolf, you know, because then what if I do become like a werewolf someday? Well, you can just explain that it's because of me that you that you asked the question that way because I was curious and that if anything like that ever actually happens, that w- how well it went is going to inform how you deal with that. Maybe maybe what I should do is go home and be like, if this happened, what would be the best way mm. for me to present this to you to convince you that it's real and take it seriously? And keep yourself out of the mental hospital. Yeah. Yeah, how would, how would, what are my options here? Yeah. What would you require as evidence? And then what would you require for me to, you know, yeah. continue? How long are you willing to entertain the idea before you need proof? Yeah. Like, do I need to tell you on the night of the full moon? <laughs> yeah. This is probably some of the issue with being the type of person I am, which I would call sometimes goofball. Mm-hmm. Is because uh, when you're trying to present something serious like that, you're never, you're not gonna get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot. All right. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna ask her. I'm gonna present this. All right. I'm, I'm interested to hear. You should also ask somebody in your life what this mm. would require, right. and then we can come back next month and be like, I'll try to remember. Here's, here's what we found out. I think we're in very different circumstances, though, because like. Probably the person who would be most affected long term would be my brother. Yeah. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that he's going to. I think if I asked him that question, he'd just be like, what? <laughs> 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 it's kind of out of character for me to ask that kind of question. So I think he'll yeah. just be confused. Yeah. I mean, to, for me to go home and ask this question is n- completely normal. Yeah. That's not. It's the subject matter is different than perhaps other questions I've asked, but the overall tone is pretty consistent here. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so now I got to figure out what I want to ask you about. I think I'm going to go with Dreadstar for variety. All right. So Dreadstar is a uh, comic book series. Like I said, I think it's late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. It's mostly done by this guy, Jim Starlin, who became a, a pretty big wheel in the uh, Marvel Comics house. Okay. The Marvel house of ideas, as they said back in the day. Oh, I had no idea um, they said that. And he, he, was, he was definitely a big rising star there, and I think he moved into like an editorial position, and he was with them for a long time. Um, he wrote The Excellent Death of Captain Marvel when the original Captain Marvel died and it was a, it's really good. Okay. So if you come across that, I think it's on Hoopla, go for it. Dreadstar is like when he decided to go off and do his own thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first, I think probably eight to 12 issues are all this like really, really pretty grayscale watercolor art. Mm, okay. And it, it looks like nothing I've ever seen before or since. And Sometimes in comics, when you have a weird art style, the problem is you've also got word balloons and it doesn't work. Right. You know, like some people have experimented with like using photographs instead of drawn art. And the thing that always pulls me out of it is the word balloon because you're like, well, I don't see word balloons above people's heads in real life. So this doesn't work. This works. So it's like really pretty to look at, but it's also functional for comics. So I, I loved it. The initial story is this very wild sort of cosmic idea where there are these, like, two sort of warring races. One is, like, this race of people who are just super destructive because basically they advanced so far that they just decided that there was, like, nothing left to do. So they just decided to conquer everything. And they're <laughs> out of boredom. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, you know, they just, it's like they weren't feeling any joy anymore. So they decided to, like, you know, there was a time a few months ago where I was like, I haven't felt much joy lately. So what I decided to do was, like, try some candy bars at the store that I'd never tried before. Yeah. How'd that uh, go? Fine. Oh, you know, so disappointed. Turns out a big hunk is not really. Top shelf candy. 
No, it's like a taffy with like, uh, it sucks. Okay. I don't know what else to say. I'm sorry to anyone who likes Big Hunk. <laughs> love the name, love the size, but the actual product, I was not yeah, a fan. Big Hunk of what is the question? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Zero bar was kind of a mixed bag. That's the white chocolate one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like white chocolate. Yeah, me neither. Which, it turns out most of the candy bars I hadn't eaten, there was a reason. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I was like, I don't know, just some something new. And I was like, what if, you know, I get these like eight candy bars. What if there is one that's really great? I don't want to spend the rest of my life not eating this candy bar that I like. Maybe you need to try like the Mexican candy. I tried a lot of Mexican candy last Halloween. Okay. And there were some really good ones, mm -hmm. but there were a lot with tamarind that yeah. I didn't care for because it turns out I, I didn't know before, but I do not care for tamarind. And a lot with chili powder. Yeah. Which, I don't know. I'm like, maybe this is something you have to like. Yeah. Just associate. Th those two flavors did not go together for me. I, like a sweet. Uh, there was a candy that's like gummy spaghetti with yep. chili powder. Yep. I had yeah. that. What is going on there? I have to admit that blew my mind. But I have a friend who was born in Mexico and he ate it. So. Yeah. It's, it's, seems like an acquired taste that yeah. I have not acquired. There was one that was like, a, I think it was a watermelon flavor candy, but it was coated in chili powder. Yeah. Once I got through the chili powder, it was amazing. But I was like, is this like a test of will? Like, <laughs> or like they're like getting through chili powder makes the candy taste that much sweeter. Something. Maybe. Or maybe you just have the palate of a weak white guy. That's possible. Yeah. I To me, it's just like chili powder to me just tastes, it reminds me of chili and it reminds me of like tacos and burritos. Yeah. And then when I move into the candy realm... That's not what I'm looking for. It doesn't give you the sweet and spicy thrill. It's just no. savory and, and no, candy. No, it wasn't like it was hot yeah. and that was the problem. I don't really like hot candy, but that, that wasn't the issue. It was like kind of a salty, earthy flavor that right. I just was like, I, this isn't... It was a sprinkling of dinner on your candy. Yeah. Gotcha. And I like some terrible candy. You know, I, I bring Bitto honey into our house despite, uh. you know, the protests of... Yeah. That, yeah. That's my, like, that's my power move of being, like, an old man, mm -hmm. is, like, disgusting candy like that. And I will fully admit that that is a terrible candy, but... I have a soft spot for peanut nougat, so... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you won't get any judgment here. <laughs> there was a, there was a candy, we had a Mexican candy that basically reminded me of Nutella, uh -huh. And I was like, yep, that'll work. Yeah, that's good. This is good stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I Back forgot what I was talking about. Dreadstar. So big cosmic story where these two warring factions. Oh, yeah. So I tried candy bars. That's my version of taking over the universe in a hostile move to destroy <laughs> all other planets. <laughs> um, so anyway, they come across this other race called the Osirosians. Okay. And they're sort of uh, an alien to us race that is sort of like Egyptian. -ish. I was going to say, is this an Osiris reference? It's like, yeah, the uh, the aesthetic of them is like okay. Egyptian, but like techno future Egyptian. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the Osirosians are the people who have the best shot of defeating this evil race. Uh, who's taking over the universe. And so they engage in like a millennia long war and the Osirosians start to realize they're not going to win. So they come up with this device that is reminiscent of the Marvel Comics device, the Ultimate Nullifier. Okay. Which is a thing Reed Richards invented in their encounter with Galactus. So Galactus came to devour the Earth. Mm -hmm. As and he does. They, yeah, that's kind of his thing. <laughs> And the only way they could think to defeat him was Reed Richards made this gizmo that was like, if I push this button, the entire universe just ends instantly. And Galactus is like, well, then you'd be dead too. But he's like, well, I'm dead either way. Right. So, you know, do you want to walk away or 
whatever. So basically, the Osirosians make a giant trumpet <laughs> that will end existence. Okay. So then this guy from the Osirosian planet recruits this odd band of people. It's kind of like a heist movie, except nonsensical. Where it's like a woman from like a fairy planet is the best I could describe. There's okay. like an ape man and there's like a, an earth lady, just kind of a normal just earth random. lady. And then a guy named Vanth Dreadstar. And that is not me mispronouncing the name Vance. His name is V-A-N-T-H Dreadstar, which is it's so distracting to me, but yeah. you just got to live with it, I That's guess. It's rough to pronounce, too. Like, rough to actually say. It's kind of hard to say, because yeah. every instinct in my mouth is like, Vance, Vance. Yeah. But then I'm saying Vanth. It's but almost it's... like you, you're forcing a lisp. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, Vanth Dreadstar is from, like, a horrible ice planet that is... Not like, Hoth? Yeah, not Hoth. One of these, like, horrible planets that they have in sci-fi where you're like, why do people live here? They have spaceships. Like, mm. go somewhere. There has to be a better planet than this. His parents get killed when he's, like, a teenager by polar bears, space polar bears. Space polar bears. Of and course. he stumbles across a magical sword that turns out it was put there by the Osirosians, for, you know, destined for someone to find it. It's a King Arthur sword in space. Exactly. Okay. A King Arthur lightsaber, let's call oh, it. Oh, a lightsaber. Yeah, it's... I wasn't going to get into it, but... <laughs> there's. <laughs> he's. It's a sword that's sort of part of him, and he can make it disappear inside of his body, and then when he needs it, he can call upon it, and it just shows up in his hands. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the more I'm describing it, the worse I'm making this thing sound. It's it's very enjoyable. Okay. It's like pulpy space nonsense. Okay. Of the greatest variety, though. So, uh, anyway, the Osirosians kind of bring an end to the universe, but then these this gathered group of people is shot off into deep space to kind of reseed life. Right. And Vanth Dreadstar is also sent off, but in a different direction. By so himself. he's in a completely different universe. Okay. He also ends up with the Osirosian guy, who he ends up killing because he's really mad. <laughs> and then regrets <laughs> doing it. But... Okay. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really thought about this whole thing. And saying it out loud, it's just... <laughs> I remember I was reading it, and then he kills this guy who's kind of been his friend. Uh-huh. Just because he's really, really furious about, you know, the whole ending the universe thing. Yeah. Which I get. But also I was like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's some... like the the shipwrecked people who are, like, on a raft in the middle of the ocean, and then one guy sees his friend as, like, a, a ham hock. Yeah. And she yes. eats him. And then he's right. like, oh, what have I done? I ate my friend. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty much instant regret that okay. he, you know, killed his friend. Right. But, you know, who destroyed the entire universe, which was bad, but, or the galaxy or something. I don't know. A, a large portion of sure. space. Okay. And, uh, you know, billions of people. But uh, basically to sp destroy this evil takeover thing. This is kind of the start <laughs> of this book. Okay. <laughs> From here, uh, Vanth Dreadstar goes on more adventures in his new home galaxy where there are these two warring factions. There's kind of a sort of mystical church version and a monarchy type version. And they're fighting each other. But it's kind of like a very lazy war where they're like, nobody really wants to win because both of their economies seem to be dependent on the continuation uh, of this war. Sure. So it's like kind of a half-hearted war. Right. But, you know, people are still dying and stuff, so it, it's bad. But no one's really inclined to stop it. Right. It's strange. Mm -hmm. It's like a war of momentum. And they're just like, eh, it's kind of what we do. Um, so he ends up putting together a new crew 
and fighting a bunch of people for reasons and going on various space adventures and it becomes more swashbuckly Mm -hmm. and more space opera yeah more space opera you know they have to like bodyguard somebody for a while um he's got a cat man friend naturally one of my favorite things in the book is like so one of these two warring factions decided to try and create the ultimate soldier and they're like, what should we do to create the ultimate soldier? And they're like, well, combine cats and humans. And it's even got in the book, like, the sort of vision of what they thought this would look like. And uh-huh. it's like this muscle-bound barbarian cat man. But what ended up happening was basically just regular-looking people with cat heads who had no interest in war and were not... A- inclined or adept i was gonna say my cats are always more interested in finding a sunbeam yep and being a loaf yeah and so it turns out they became like really good farmers so they kind of just left them on this planet to farm and my favorite thing about it is i was like this is someone who understands cat behavior yes because the only way you could turn a cat into not like a vicious hunter is to demand that of a cat (laughs) and then it will then it will become a farmer, yeah. which is something cats have never had any interest in yeah. or, you know, skills. Well, we all know they're afraid of cucumbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, lots of just sort of fun space nonsense. Vanth Dreadstar is definitely kind of like your proto Mary Sue character. Okay. Where you're just like, he's amazing at everything right. and whatever, but you can get over it. Like, it's not yeah. a big deal. A lot of the character designs are really interesting. A lot of the, you know, the, his his crew he puts together is bizarre. It's just a lot of, like, early comics nonsense where everything is just wild. And you can tell nobody who was working at these comics companies was, like, advising this down a commercially viable path. Right. <laughs> so if that's your jam, uh, Dreadstar is really good. Okay. I'm enjoying it. But it's been a lot of repeating of, like, the same stuff Mm. over and over, I think, to try and remind you. Because it is kind of a convoluted story (laughs) that brings us to where we are. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So that's a little tough on me. And then, you know, some of the stories are a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just, like, not that interesting. Yeah. And then about halfway through the first volume, the art changes to what I would call more standard comic art. So it's not as compelling right. to, you know, look at the pages mm-hmm. and stuff. All right. So you want me to tell you which one I would abandon? Yeah. And it can be any of the four. Or we could do that at the very end here. Okay. After I give you my brief versions of the Good others. Idea. Should we do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to hear about This Is How You Lose the Time War. Okay. You could sing the title if you'd like. Nope. Okay. Nope. Not doing that. I'm, 99%, I'm trying my best to forget that. I thought 99% sure that you would say no, but I was like, there is a 1%. Is half there? Half a percent. Yeah, not really. <laughs> I'm like, in an infinite number of multiverses, there's one universe. That's true. Where the song is sung. But I'm like, this is not that universe. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> multiverses, I just have to put in a quick pitch for the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh, yeah? It was so good. Pretty good? Yeah. It was bizarre. It, you would love it, I think. Yeah. Um, thumbs up. Anyway. I don't is... know. I'm not really into, like, weird nonsense. Stop it. If it doesn't have a cat man, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> well, it does have people with hot dog fingers. Okay. See? I'm I'm back in. Yep, I knew it. Hot dog fingers. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll like it. You I'm back. It. I'm 100%. <laughs> that's all it takes. All right, so that's the movie. Now we're going to the book. The okay. book does not have people with hot dog fingers. So this is how you lose the time war. It's an epistolary novel. Okay. So it's written pretty much entirely as these letters between these two people, the one uh, agent for the garden and one agent for the agency. So the garden, as I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to hear, is like very much into nature and the earth and 
organically creating systems like that kind of thing. And then you have the agency, which is very much into machinery and genetic engineering and, you know, you're able to kind of control your body temperature through like neural implants and stuff like that. Gotcha. So just to give you an idea of the difference between them. Okay. And they are both fighting a war that's been going on for like for who knows how long. It's like a war through time and dimensions. And they're so the world is what they call they or like maybe time is what they refer to as the braid. Okay. And so they are both like planting moments in time and in space that will affect the outcome of the time war for their victory basically okay hold on so like i would travel to somewhere and do something right that would so hopefully you, have would an say, effect like, travel up the braid to this place and time and you would like save a life or okay um send someone on a journey or kill somebody right that will tip the odds in that place and time in your favor <laughs> okay sorry right. i just yeah i think i got it yeah i was picturing like if i was doing this in real life they'd be like we're gonna send you up the braid and what we want you to do is like uh this guy drops his keys yeah and we want you to pick up his keys and give him his keys back i mean it could be that and i'd simple. be like what okay yeah it could it could be that simple or it could be a matter of like embedding yourself in a town for half a lifetime okay to accomplish a thing okay and so you've got blue is the name of the agent for the garden okay and red is the agent for the agency okay and the book opens and i think red is reading a letter from blue to start and it's basically so they are both like the best agents that the that each that group their has. Place. They're the, yeah they're both the tip top best of everything They've been kind of chasing each other through time and space for, you know, a very long time. And they see evidence of each other's work. And there's a, a grudging respect has grown between them. Okay. So they now, start right. Yeah. These agents were to, like, collide. Would they, like, try to kill each other? Or does that just not well, really a thing? Or I don't think that they attack each other directly. It doesn't okay. seem like the the two organizations interact directly they seem more interested in guiding the the direction of the world to make their final oh. reality okay. but um it does like the question does eventually come up of can one of them eliminate the other gotcha um and which would then like give them a huge advantage gotcha okay right? So they write letters to each other. There's this, this respect kind of has grown between them because they both recognize in each other a master of their craft. And they do things very differently. Like um, the, the garden is known for basically planting their agents like seeds in a time. And they kind of, they become interwoven in the time and place that they're working in. And it's very hard to unpick that. Okay. Whereas the agency will go in and they kind of, they perform an act. Right. I don't know why I'm getting so into this. None of this actually is. Uh, the this point is interesting to me. Yeah, I mean it's. I mean, I just talked about Catman for like twenty point. minutes. Like, <laughs> I don't think you've overstayed your welcome yet. <laughs> well, and um, when you go to Goodreads, it's it's a bunch of people going, "This is amazing. This is the most beautiful book ever written," and a bunch of people saying, "What happened? Nothing. I don't understand anything." Any Divisive. Of this. So that's kind of why I think I'm getting mired in some of these details because it's it's a difficult book to to describe. Okay. Um, it's written very poetically, and these letters between the two. And I say letters, but they're not. It's not like they write it down on paper and put it in a tree stump for each other to find. They're letters in the in the sense of like, um, almost like you know they put a message inside a tree that they knew would be cut down at a time when the other person would be there. And there's like some hidden message in the dots in the tree rings or something like that. Okay. So that's what I mean by letters. It's so, like a very cryptic, exactly. but the other person, because they're such a good Because they're both yeah, so skilled thing. and they're looking yeah, okay. for it. They, they see it. Gotcha. Right. 
And so they're communicating back and forth and they slowly over time, they become more like love letters Ah. and it becomes apparent that they, as different as they are, have, um, have grown attached to each other, but neither one of them can let their respective organizations know this. They like, they don't even know that they've been communicating. Like that would be a reason for them to be like, she would be thrown out of the garden and you know, the, the agent would be killed. Red would be killed. Makes sense. Yeah. And so then it becomes this whole question of how, like, what does existence look like for the two of them? Because if one of them wins, the other is destroyed. Um, If neither of them win, they're constantly fighting. Both of them can't win. So I think that's where the title comes from. This is how you lose the time war. Okay. You know, how do you find an ending for both of them or can you? Right. Um, And what decision do you make a decision for the benefit of your organization and your people? Or do you have feeling so many, so much feeling for the other person that you are willing to lose the time war so that they can win and will continue to exist? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's relatively blowing my mind a little bit. Yeah. It's very much a, a book of ideas and not, so much plot. Okay. Um, very beautifully written. It's written by two different people. I believe Amal El Motar wrote all of Blue's letters, and uh, Max Gladstone wrote all of Red le- Red's letters. And they didn't communicate between each other. Like they would just send it to each other what they'd written, and they were surprised by what they got and reacted to it. And that's how the book was written. Wow. Okay. Them, which I think is pretty cool. That's yeah. That's yeah. unusual way to yeah write a book. And. Um, for a lot of the of the book, I was reading it and thinking, like, this is really interestingly written, and I'm, like, impressed by it, but I couldn't say that I was enjoying it. And then I got to the end, and the way that they wrapped up the story, I loved. Oh, okay. And so I walked away being, like, I'm more in the camp of, like, I thought this was pretty good. Like, the beginning, maybe not my favorite. The end, I loved it ends up being as a whole something that I like have respect for. Like, I think it's a good book, but it's unusual. Well, it sounds like maybe one where that payoff that comes at the end makes it better. It makes it good. And so like, if you'd known the whole time, like this does pay off, it's Mm -hmm. worth it. Like maybe that would. Yeah. I think that's part of it. And I think also just the way that it's written, it's written very abstract poetic. Yeah. And I think there are some people who are just not going to enjoy that. Yeah. That's fair. (laughs) And uh, yeah. And you know, that's, that's the way some brains work and that's fine. That sounds pretty cool though, as like a concept. Yeah. I think you might dig it actually. It sounds like the kind of book that you could get into, I think. Is, so is this a, would you call this book a romance or is it like kind of a... I would call it a love story. Okay. Um, it has elements of romance, but that is not the the reason the for it. The core of the... Yeah. I mean, okay. it kind of is, but there's no sense of like, I don't know. It's, That's fair. The ultimate meaning of the book is found outside the relationship, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Like... Like I said, this book is slippery. It's hard to grab a hold of. And I think maybe that's why... I will say, I read this for my romance book club. I read romance novels with a bunch of other librarians. And we read by subgenre. And so this book we selected as our romance adjacent. Oh, okay. And I think it's perfect for that. I think if you go in looking for a romance novel, you're not going to be pleased. Gotcha. But if you like a love story and, you know star-crossed lovers thing and especially considering that they've never actually met like it's all through letters they brush past each other in time and space but they've never actually met each other had a conversation okay so it's a very atypical yeah romance element in that way yeah that's cool but in the end i walked away really glad i'd read it now is this like a you know i don't i feel like i'm not in touch with this as far as like if it's making a splash in the wider book world, or is this like a more I under the radar is. title? Or? Um, I will say that I had to borrow a copy from a friend of mine oh, okay. because the hold list was not moving fast enough for me to get it in time okay. for our meeting. Um, so I, it's that's not to say that it's like a huge deal because we only have two copies, I think, in our catalog. Gotcha. And there were two people waiting for it. 
Okay. So it's not like there's a 40-person queue. Okay. But it did get good reviews, and I think people were kind of talking about it. It's not a ama- It's not James Patterson. Right. But I think that people who get really into books have heard of it and are intrigued by it. Okay. Well, that's like, I feel like that's the perfect kind of book to talk about here because right. it's like something that sounds like it would be appealing to a lot of people who maybe aren't hearing about it in their normal circles, yeah. you know? like I hope so. And it is equally possible that people are going to get turned off by this. I sure. will say that me and my friend Jesse both enjoyed it for in the, in a similar way where we found the beginning of a little bit impenetrable at yeah. times and then we loved the end. The other people in our book group did not enjoy it. So do you kind of if someone was reading it, should they kind of just like go with the flow at the yeah. beginning and just let it sort of just experience happen it. and then Um I don't I think if you're trying to pin down what's happening too hard. Yeah you're just going to get frustrated. Yeah. I think you just kind of have to accept what you can understand and trust that what you don't understand is true and matters in some way. Okay. And just let, like, let it go. It's like meditation, maybe acknowledge the thought, acknowledge the confusion and then let it throw flow right past you. Makes sense. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, I, I ended up, and you know, the more I talk about it, the more I think, I feel like I liked it. Like, I think I've, I'm more enthusiastic about it, talking about it now, than I felt when I finished it. Okay. If that makes sense. Sometimes they, like, stay with you and you find yourself thinking about it, even though at the time you were like, this isn't a huge impact. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, weeks later, you're like, I'm still thinking about this. Like, I guess this was more than I thought it was. Well, and interestingly, I believe that this is being adapted into a television series. Oh, okay. So... We will likely be hearing more about it once that gets off the ground. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. That's how that goes. <laughs> so yeah, everyone can get in on the ground floor on this one and then be the, the person who knew it before it was big. I like it. Yeah. It's like right in there too with, it seems like there's this trend in fiction of like long titles. Yeah. This is how you lose the time this war. This is how you lose the time war. <laughs> <laughs> like, Short book, long title. Yeah. <laughs> 10% of the title is, or the book is the title. Okay. All right. Hit me with your four. Okay. I had four arguments for the elimination of television by Jerry Mander, which I think is a pen name because that's yeah, a name. Yeah, Jerry Mander. Um, <laughs> it's so clever, it's, though. Yeah. I like it. So this is a, by a guy who worked in marketing, and he was working in marketing sort of at the dawn of not the dawn of television marketing, but once they started to really figure out how easy it was to influence people through television and like political marketing and other things like that. And he was very disturbed by this and was starting to think that maybe television wouldn't be a good thing for people. So he kind of goes through why he doesn't think that. Um, One of the things that I thought was really compelling early on in the book is he's talking about how, you know, like Library of Congress, for example, started collecting TV broadcasts. Mm -hmm. And like that way we would have an archive to go look back at and see like what was going on in the world. Yeah. But he makes this really good point about how the problem with doing that is what we're really seeing is the mediated version of what was going on in the world. Right. So really it tells us more about what media was like at the time than it does the actual events of the time. Well, isn't that true of newspapers? Probably. Um, You know, his point with that was sort of like that newspapers were a little bit less controlled by the need to push out advertising and to, They existed less as a space for advertising, at least at that time. I mean, now it's like a very different world. Yes. (laughs) Which is why it's sort of an interesting book to read is because the things that he's concerned with with television have also happened in news, have happened on the internet, obviously, is a huge thing. Yeah. Well, uh, and the first thing that occurred to me was um, the Library of Congress collecting tweets. Right. Right. And so it's like, well, this is what happened you know with this event but another way of looking that is 
this is what people were tweeting about this event. Right. Is that necessarily what was happening? Right. You know, is that a true historical account? But is there such thing as a true historical Yeah, exactly. Um, Ooh, now we get into it. I know. (laughs) One of the uh, most interesting parts is he talks about how uh, someone did this experiment where they were, like, asking people to imagine a basketball game and just, like, picture it in their head. Yeah. And he's like, after the introduction of television, most people pictured a basketball game as depicted on TV as opposed to one that they actually were attending or one One that they played in or, yeah. Yeah. It was like they were picturing a television broadcast. Hmm. And so he's like, it's changing the way we think and it's changing the way we see the world. And I'm not sure that's a good thing. Hmm. Okay. Then I had A Place of My Own, the Michael Pollan book about yep. building a place of his own. <laughs> Dreadstar by Jim Starlin, Catman in Space. <laughs> and then Command and Control by Eric Schlosser. So uh, this is a very long, in-depth exploration of sort of the Titan missile program during the Cold War. Yeah. And there's actually a lot more drama and weird things happening with that than I think any of us really knew. Um, The beginning of the book is about there was an explosion or a fire in one of the bunkers and several people died because uh, a lot of the chemicals and stuff that were used to launch the rocket and to keep it at a certain temperature range and stuff like that were really super dangerous. And there's, like, a huge problem is caused because a guy, like, drops a socket wrench and it falls through a a graded floor and, you know, knocks into something and it causes this huge problem. So it's it's interesting. It's really long. Um, Like, really, really long. So I'm not sure. Uh, You know, it's hard for me to maintain the momentum into it. Yeah. I feel like I haven't reached. How far into it are you? five or ten percent oh boy and you're already there yeah and i'm like i'm wondering how far because i think if i get to a certain point i'll be in but i'm like what's the uh you know what do they call that like the break through the atmosphere speed that you have to get you know I, i don't know if i can make that critical speed adjustment to make it all the way (laughs) into outer space gonna and, bounce off the atmosphere <laughs> yeah i'm gonna come crashing down to earth as i have so many times yeah. hmm. um and it's one that i i would say i've flirted with in the past you know just read a very brief portion of and yeah. really enjoyed it but maybe that's also a sign of I yeah don't know. when you say really enjoyed it yeah did you really enjoy it if you didn't keep going I think my memory of it is that I did really enjoy it. The problem was I was listening to it on audiobook, and then a book that I really super wanted to read came out. Okay. I've got my two Chucks, Chuck Palahniuk and Chuck Klosterman. Right. And a new Chuck Palahniuk book came out. So I threw this to the side for the new Chuck Palahniuk book. Okay. All right. So you want my um, my advice on these? Yeah, I want at least one to get rid of. All right. If you were like, get rid of them all, I guess I could. But Well, it sounds to me like you are enough engaged in the four arguments for the elimination of television and Dread Star to keep going with them. I agree. The other two, I'm not so sure. I feel like you're intellectually engaged with command and control and... It might be worth giving yourself a page goal, and if you're not fully committed by the page goal, then bail. Okay. And as for a place of my own, it's hard for me to tell. It almost feels like you've kind of gotten what you're going to get out of it, and maybe you can let it go. Mm, yeah. But I'm. But it's hard for me to say because I'm not you. Because yeah. you do seem to be enjoying elements of it, but you also seem to be kind of over it. Yeah. That sounds accurate. Well, I think what I need for you to do is to be my executioner today. All right. To cut one of those books and just be like, I can't do it, but it needs to be done. I'm going to tell you to stop reading A Place of My Own. Done. And set yourself a page goal for command and control. Okay. And if you aren't into it by that page goal, cut that one too. This is excellent advice. All right. 
Yeah, and I wanted to bring these in this sort of format because I was like, you know, I'm usually pretty good about quitting books that yeah. I don't like, but every once in a while I get mired down because yeah. I'm as do we all in too many. So this is exactly what I needed. All right. And for everyone out there who's feeling that way, just have one of your friends. Yeah. Explain your books to your friends, and then they can tell you which ones to cut out of your life. Yeah. And if you walk away and you're feeling really bummed about the fact that you don't get to finish that book, maybe that tells you something. That's true. Yeah. So. Yeah, or if you're feeling like, I'm free. Yeah. Then you've made a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's do your, uh, your four. My four? All right. Uh, so my first book was The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. Super charming rom-com. Like, especially for anybody who's interested in STEM or women in STEM. Uh, it deals a lot with um, issues of, like, women in academia, women in science, and some of the problems that they can encounter. It's The main character is Olive Smith, and she is researching pancreatic cancer, which made me root her on because I have a particular hatred of cancer, as do, I think, a lot of us. Um, and so it was nice to have someone who you're like, kick cancer butt. Yeah. Like, and rooting for her. You go get them. Yep. So she is a, a grad student working towards uh, her PhD. And when she's there to interview for the program, this is like, I don't know, three or four years before the story really starts. She um, is wearing expired contact lenses <laughs> because she's a poor student. And it's making her eyes water terribly. Uh -huh. And she goes into a bathroom to, like, splash water on her face and try to get it under control. And it turns out she went into the men's room. Mm -hmm. And so she's talking to somebody she can't really see who gives her advice about whether or not she has what it takes to be in science. And it ends up giving her a lot of confidence about her path in life. Uh -huh. And then we open on her being in school and being in the midst of a pretty exciting research product project about biomarkers for cancer, which I won't get really into, although I have family researching this, so it was exciting for me to read. <laughs> You're like nerding out and romancing out yeah, at the much. same time. It's a, it was geared right for me. I, I was think. about to say, like, is this person like, you know, sometimes you get suspicious. You're like, are these people listening to my conversations? Like, yeah. 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 Kind of. <laughs> but That's... anyway, so she, um, she is in her, her career, and there was a guy that she went on one date with but didn't really hit it off with, but it turns out that her best friend is interested, but refusing to date him because they had gone out and she doesn't want to, like, poach. So Bro code for lady scientists? Exactly. Okay. So Olive, our main character, she has lied to her friend and said, it does, I really don't care. I'm dating someone else anyway. She's not actually dating someone else. Oh. So she's walking through the science building, and she sees, she's told her best friend that she is seeing the guy she's dating that night, but she's actually at the science building doing research. So she sees her friend in the hallway, panics, sees uh, a guy in front of her, and just kisses him, just lays one on him in the middle of the hall so that her friend will think, you know, like, oh, well, she was seeing the guy. Yep. Turns out that the guy she kissed is actually full faculty and she's a student. <laughs> so that's, that's a problem. And also he is like the big scary faculty member who is seen as unapproachable and aloof and yeah. So the worst possible person exactly to have just randomly been in the wrong place at the right time. Exactly. <laughs> And so it becomes a matter of she can't tell her friend that she lied. She ends up talking to the, the faculty guy and saying, like, this is why I did it. I'm so sorry. Like, she, she has a meeting with him, and she's like, I completely understand if you want to report me for Title IX. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'll never do it again. And then it turn, he, he, like, makes the suggestion, well, what if we pretend to date? Because my research funds have been frozen, because they're afraid I'm going to leave Stanford and go somewhere else mm. and take my research with me. Mm. And so if I'm dating someone here, maybe they'll believe that I don't have any intentions of leaving and they'll unfreeze my research funds. Okay. And you can convince your friend that you're dating someone else. And so we'll fake date for a the while. The mutually beneficial setup exactly. for fake dating. And it has all of that the stuff like you want That is like a cornerstone of a rom-com of like... I get this, you get that. Exactly. 
It has all the force proximity. There's a conference road trip that involves a potential only one bed situation that ends oh, up being sure. a close call. <laughs> but <laughs> and there's like uh, great secondary characters, and there's somebody that you grow to really hate. And he gets some comeuppance, and that's mm, satisfying. So that's a good one. It's just a really satisfying, fleshed-out rom-com. It's exactly what... I mean, it's doing really well. It's very popular, and I see why. Sounds good. Yep, it's great. I like it. I was always, like, in my, you know, single days, mm -hmm. you'd see a rom-com or something, and I'd be like, you know, if, like, there was some way for me to signal, like, hey, if you're if you're a Sandy Bullock type, and... You need to like make out with a guy in a hallway is like a <laughs> cover story. I'm game. Is there a sign that you can carry? Yeah, like, like you know, up to be a rom rom com hero. Is there some kind of like weird patterned shirt that I can wear right. that signals like I'm cool with that? Ready for a meet cute? Yeah. <laughs> then I feel like the the you know official United States rom com industry whatever would come and be like. Mm, I think you're more goofball friend. I'm sorry. Like, uh, <laughs> I think you're the side character, I sir. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was great. So I recommend it. Sounds good. Then we have This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone, which I'm recommending ever more highly the more I talk about it. Then we have The Beast in Isle 34 by Darren Doyle, which we also talked about. It's one that I'm curious to see where it's going, but I'm finding it difficult to find the motivation to keep up with it. Okay. We'll see how that works out. And then the last one that I had was Crushing by Sophie Burroughs, and it is a uh, graphic novel that is almost entirely wordless, and all of the illustrations are mostly black and white with hints of red. Huh. And the red um, is used to really nice effect to, like, send a message about how characters are feeling or to draw attention to certain elements in a drawing, which is really nice. You've got um, two main characters living in a city and, uh, like, pretty modern existence. The woman is, um, she works in, like, a coffee shop and she feels like, if as you're, like, watching her go through her day, you can see her by noticing, like... Um, all of the dating advice in magazines and the lingerie in shop windows and the romances on TV. And it feels like it, it makes her feel ever more isolated and alone seeing all of seeing everybody else being happy and she's feeling very alone. And then you have another character who is a guy and he's having a similar experience where he sees like the movies on his Netflix queue are all like macho and like this and that and the other. And, also feeling very kind of alone and like he doesn't fit. And you watch these two kind of living their lives in this city and kind of almost passing by each other in these, these flitting moments. And I don't know, it was a very, very, very fast, like you could read this in half an hour tops. Um, but it's a nice way to think about connection in like, and the lack of connection in modern life and how it affects your mood and also how you can affect your mood to affect your perception, mm. I guess. Yeah. But it, it was it was charming and fast. And if you're looking for, you know, a very, very quick book to just break yourself out of a reading slump, I think it's a good option. Nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. There we go. We did it. Eight books. Eight more books. Yeah. Down. We are on a roll. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think we're succeeding. I think so, too. By my completely subjective, made-up standards. Of actually completing the recordings every month. Yeah. Well, and I'm going to try, I wrote down to try and remind myself to ask my werewolf question. Oh, yeah, please do. So I can, uh, that we've got that for next time. So everyone's hooked now for yeah. next time. And now we'll probably forget and everyone's going to be left hanging and we'll be for have forgotten. Yep. That'll be terrible. Yeah, either everything will be forgotten and nothing matters or yeah. I'll remember and we'll have a slight moment of excitement yeah if we leave you hanging uh, apologies in advance because <laughs> we'll have we'll forget to apologize next time it feels like i feel like we're getting good at doing this but we're still really i'm bad at pitching it like yeah stay tuned next time for a thing that i 50 50 will remember <laughs>
everybody at home can't wait yep we're like we're gonna do this thing we're gonna do it mediocre yeah but we're gonna do it and we hope that you'll join us probably gonna do it that's you know what let's call it double drama because it's like will it happen right and then if it does happen what's the answer will they remember place so there's bets. really two questions yeah <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see everyone next time. Yeah, thanks for joining us.